shortly and we're going to pray together and get started. Uh, may I request somebody to please uh, pray with the class and we will start. All right, um, Afni to or Elisha, go ahead. Uh, Master Lord Jesus, we are grateful once again for this opportunity to gather here this morning. Father, we pray, commit ourselves into your hands. It is our prayer that you continue to guide us, Lord, open our understanding and help us to absorb and to digest on your word in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray that at the end of the class, glory and honor shall be to your name. We commit Pastor Ashes to your hands, O oh God. Continue to grant him utterances and insights that he will be able to impact us for your glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Ravan. Thanks for joining um, this class. Um, BC 209 on holiness. We are in a short in between section uh, where we are addressing the important issue of uh, repentance, uh, recovery, and uh, restoration, restoration and recovery. Uh, so we, last week, we highlighted the importance of repentance in the believer's life. So many times we think uh, repentance is only for the unsaved. Now, for the unsaved, of course, repentance is important. But we have also established that repentance is important even in the life of the believer. That means, uh, you know, I can't, as a believer, I can't say I don't need to repent. And I would need to repent whenever I do something wrong in thought, word, or deed, I need to repent before God. That means I need to change my thinking and my action. I need to repent. And part of that is where we confess to God and we receive forgiveness, the cleansing of the blood of Jesus and receive forgiveness of sins, right? So that must not be lost in the life of the believer. And we established you know, several aspects of it. We looked at Romans, Romans chapter six, Romans chapter 12, you know, how Paul brings that out. Uh, we looked at uh, his teaching to the church, uh, Paul's writings to in the epistles. It's clearly there that we have to deal with sin and repent. And uh, we also talk up, spoke about, we close uh, towards how the Lord Jesus spoke to the seven churches. And to five out of the seven churches, his message is very clear. You have to repent. And uh, we highlighted the fact that uh, to the church in Ephesus, the reason he said you have to repent is because they left their first love. To the church in Smyrna and Pergamos, uh, not to Smyrna, to the church in Pergamos and Thyatira, uh, they had tolerated, they were tolerating wrong doctrine to the church in Sardis. Um, so therefore they had to repent to the church in Sardis. Um, they had a great reputation, great name, but uh, he said, I don't find your works perfect before me. And um, uh, one of the things that we can see from Revelation 3, the church in Sardis is that people had defiled themselves, meaning they're doing things that are sinful and then also doing the works. That means the ministry and he says the works are not perfect. That's the church in Sardis and therefore he says you need to repent. And then lastly, the church in Laodicea, uh, they were a church that was self-deceived. They said, you know, we are fine, we are rich, we are, we've got everything going. But the Lord says you're actually poor, naked and blind. And uh, that's your real spiritual condition. And so he says, you know, you need to buy from me. That means you need to pay the price um, to receive gold, white garments, and anointing. 
So the energy is still in the beginning. You need to pay the price. Don't don't think you're all fine, self-sufficient, actually in self-deception. So essentially, the Lord is rebuking various churches because of what he's finding lacking there. And then we went into chapter, uh, let me share this PDF. Then we went to the next chapter where we said, you know, uh, even though, uh, yeah, in chapter five, uh, even though, you know, we may make a difference between lust and adultery, hate or murder, pride and immorality, sexual immorality, immorality and sowing disunity and idolatry. And you know, in our minds, we may draw a distinction between these things. In the scripture, all of them are an abomination to God. Everything, you know, it's an abomination. God doesn't like it. And so, you know, um, all, you know we must call sin, sin, all sins, big and small, the big and small is more in our minds, but in God's eyes, speaking lies uh, is as wicked as killing the innocent. Sowing disunity is same as idolatry, you know, and, and, and it's all given in these verses. So we have to change how we look at sin and we have to, you know, uh, our, our, our pursuit must be, I want to cleanse myself from all filthiness. All filthiness, whether small or big, you know, I want, I don't want anything in my heart that's in my heart or mind or my life that's not pleasing to God, you know, whether in thought, word or deed. I want to be, I want to perfect holiness, right, in the fear of God. So that's the motivation. That's uh, what we are pursuing. Okay, so we're going to move forward from here. We, we stopped here uh, last week. So we're moving forward from there. So our next question that we want to understand uh, for ourselves and as well as when we are dealing with other people is what would bring a person to a place of repentance? What, what, you know, what brings a person to a place where they would realize that something is wrong and I need to turn to God and I need to change my thinking and my acting, my, what I'm doing. Uh, here are some things that we need to keep in mind, which we see in scripture. Aye. So first, first one is uh, somebody's mic is on. Can be done. Okay, thank you. So the first thing we see, the Bible says in Romans chapter 2 verse 4, says that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. So you see, do, you know, Paul's writing, of course, in Romans. He says, you know, don't despise the rich, riches of his goodness, his uh, forbearance, his long-suffering, his patience, knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. Right? So that's the first thing. That, and this, you know, we're just looking at what the scripture is saying, right? I'm not saying everything for every person, but these are the various things that will bring people to repentance. So we need to understand what, what we should uh, be administering or looking at in any given situation, okay? So in some situations, it's God's goodness that's going to bring a person to repentance. And that goodness often has to be demonstrated through us that you love, that you're good to somebody, and they are touched by that, and then they're drawn to God and through the process of repentance. So keep in mind the goodness of God. And that goodness must be expressed, of course, made tangible through you and me. And uh, that goodness can be made, can be made tangible through answered prayer, through a healing, through a miracle, so on and so forth, the goodness of God. Secondly, uh, we see, which I just kind of made reference is, um, the work and miracles of God leads people to repentance in some situations. How do we know that? You know, here in Matthew 11, uh, Jesus went into these cities, he did mighty works, and what was his expectation? His expectation was that they should repent. So, if you ask 
you know, of course they didn't. That that's that's another issue. But the expectation is what I'm looking at. Is when he did his mighty works, he was looking, or you could say, one of the outcomes of those miracles, healings, was he was looking for them to be drawn by that to repentance. Right? But these people were so hard. They refused, you know, Bethsaida and others, other cities. Um, they refused, even though they had the miracles of God taking place. So in general, the mighty works of God are God's invitation to repent. And a beautiful example is in Luke 5, and you think about Peter, you know, and this is Jesus, you know, he's, he worked the miracle of the, uh, the great catch of fish. When Peter saw that happen, his immediate re reaction was, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Now, as he, he, the miracle of the great catch of fish had a deep effect on him. And he recognized he needed to turn to the Lord and you know, follow the Lord. And he left, left everything and followed Jesus. So there are times, I'm not saying always, but there are times the miracles of God will lead somebody to repentance. Sometimes, you know, people take the miracle and they go away. Uh, we, we've seen that and we know that. But uh, the reason God works those miracles in their lives is an invitation for them to turn to him or to repent. Uh, and so, you know, when somebody's in sin or whether it's a believer or it's a non-believer, you know, we should go ahead and let you know, invite God to work miracles. Because perhaps, perhaps, that would draw them to turn to the Lord. I'm not saying it always will, but that's one avenue, one invitation for people to repent, uh, come to the Lord. The third thing we see in Scripture is godly sorrow. Now, Paul says, yeah, 2 Corinthians 7, 9 to 10. You were made sorry in a godly manner. You were made sorry in a godly manner. And he says, you know, I, I rejoice. So he's writing to Corinthians. This is the second letter to them. So I rejoice. That you were made, not that you were just made sorry, but your sorrow led you to repentance. And then he says, you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. So, you know, in chapter 7, Paul is kind of justifying why he wrote a very strong letter first. You know, his first letter was very strong. Put away from you that sinful person. You know, I'm surprised you haven't dealt with him yet. That's First Corinthians chapter 5. And then in Second Corinthians 7, he's, 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 he's now, you know, explaining to the Corinthians why he was very strong. He says, you know, and, 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 and I, I really deeply appreciate what, you know, I'm just paraphrasing what you, what you did. He says, you were made sorry in a godly manner. And I'm happy about it because your sorrow led you to repentance. So sometimes we must keep in mind that the sin or the things that are wrong had to be confronted, have to be rebuked, have to be addressed in a strong way but with the intent of bringing that person to a place of godly sorrow. That means, hey, what I've done is wrong. And that leads the person to repentance. And this is what Paul did with the Corinthians. So his first letter was a strong rebuke. And then in the second letter, he explains, look, you know, your godly sorrow, it was a good thing because it brought you to repentance and resulted in salvation. And you don't have to regret that. 
So when we are dealing with people or in our own lives, we must understand the importance of godly sorrow. That means you are feeling sorry, but it's in a manner that brought, brings you toward God and not just taking you away from God or, or making you sorry for yourself or sorry that you were found out or sorry that you're getting into trouble. That's not the point. The point is there is, it's a godly sorrow. It's a sorrow that draws you towards the Lord and recognizing that what is wrong was not pleasing to him. And lastly, we also see in scripture that God grants repentance. You know, so Paul is writing to Timothy and telling him how to, you know, how he should be the servant of the Lord and don't quarrel with people. You know, be gentle, teach them, be patient. And he says, you know, you do this even with those who are in opposition. So that means, of course, there are going to be, be, be there are going to be people who are going to oppose what you're saying. They're going to oppose you as a person and so on. But in humility, you speak to them. Why? If God would perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. And that they may escape, come to the senses and escape the snare of the devil. Having been taken captive by him to do as well. So he's recognizing that, you know, sometimes people who are in opposition to the truth or against the truth, they have in some way come under the snare of the devil. They've come under the influence of the devil. Paul's recognizing that. And from a human standpoint, he's telling Timothy, Timothy, you know, and you stay humble. You don't you don't argue, you don't fight. Just be humble and you teach, you correct, you give the truth to those who are opposing you and let God do the work of bringing them to repentance and embracing the truth. So God granting them repentance, again, we have to understand it the way we were talking about early in the earlier class, meaning God is moving upon them bringing them to that place of repentance. But ultimately, they have to repent, right? Their choice and their response is involved. But God will work on that. Through Timothy, Timothy's role is in humility, you give them the truth. Recognize the devil is at work. Trying to hold them captive. But let the Lord move upon them to bring them to a place of repentance. So sometimes we just have to work like this when you're working with certain people that you present the truth and say, God, and, and you're praying for them, of course, you intercede for them and say, God, you grant them, you bring them to this place of repentance. So in scripture, what we are seeing is that there are at least these four ways mentioned for us that a person can be brought to a place of repentance, an experience of God's goodness, an experience of the miracles of God, sometimes being brought to a place of godly sorrow, uh, which could happen through a rebuke or an instruction. And sometimes it's just somebody presenting the truth and knowing that there's a spiritual battle and you're engaging in it, praying for them and let God, let God move upon them, bring them to a place of repentance. Now, repentance is our first step to recovery and restoration. That's kind of the direction I want us to, I mean, the direction we're going to go from here. That sometimes our sin takes us so far away from what God wants for us. I'm not saying this is going to happen every time, right? 
see, we all make small mistakes. We immediately realize it and we repent. God, I'm sorry. I should not have got angry or I should not have, you know, I should not have spoken like this to that person or whatever, you know, and we, we repent. But sometimes a believer can take the road like the prodigal son. You know, and we know that story of the prodigal son who, I mean, everything was right. Everything was going fine. He was in his father's house, but he took what was his and he wandered away. He wasted everything. He, he was so far gone. Until the moment came, Luke 15, 17, he realized, it's a, the Bible just says, he came to himself and he said, that, that's his moment of repentance. Hey, something I need to, you know, he changed his thinking. He changed his thinking right there while he was feeding the pigs. He changed his thinking. He said, you know, there are servants in my father's house who are in a better place than me. I need to go back. So repentance happened right there. And then he made, he made his long journey back to the father's house. So there was recovery. There was a journey of recovery that he made. And then there was beautiful restoration. You know, the father welcomed him and clothed him and put a ring on him and sandals on his feet and celebrated restoration. Now, Sometimes believers make this prodigal son journey. You know, I'm not, I, I'm repeating what I said. Not, not every sin takes us this far, but sometimes continual sin will take a person down this road. The question is, what if Luke 15, 17 never happened? What if this prodigal son, when he was at his low point, never changed his mind? He was stubborn, he was rebellious, and he just refused to accept that he had messed up. Then he would have probably, you know, we don't know, it would have just wandered further and further away. The story would have had, would have had a different ending. But the good thing is, repentance happened. And there was a journey of recovery. He had to make the journey back home to his father. And then there was restoration. And sometimes in our own lives or in the lives of the people we are helping, this process needs to happen. Because sometimes either we or maybe the people we are working with have made this prodigal son journey far, far, far away from the purpose of God for our lives. So while repentance on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, could happen in a very small way, uh, meaning, you know, like we said, you do something wrong, you immediately realize it, and you say, God, I changed my thinking about it, forgive me, and you return. Sometimes, in some cases, this long journey of recovery and restoration is needed. And I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, be, you know, now, okay, before we get into that, uh, what, what I you know, want to tell us is, on a day-to-day -day basis, one of the best things to do is to keep short accounts. That as soon as you know something is wrong, just turn to God. Keep short accounts. You know, don't don't ever make that prodigal son journey. Don't ever do it. You know, we must be quick to repent. Something is wrong. Just God, I am sorry, and get yourself back in line with God. Right. And uh, you know whether God corrects you uh, in a time of prayer or through the Word. You know, uh, sometimes the word is spoken to us. You hear a sermon. You hear some other believer sharing something, and, uh, uh, and 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 we should turn to God. And remember, whenever our hearts turn to God, there is healing. 
you know, when we understand and we turn, what will happen? God will heal us. You know, so what does this do for us? When we understand with our hearts and we turn, God heals us. Right? So the key is you understand what's, what God is telling you. Hey, that was wrong. The way you spoke was wrong. The way you said was what you said was. You rec understand with your heart. You embrace it. Turn back to the Lord. He heals us. Right? So that's the best way. Keep it simple. Keep it short. Keep short accounts. But sometimes it has to go through a process. Meaning if a believer doesn't keep short accounts, they're going to be like this prodigal son. They're going to make a long journey far, far away from the will of God until finally dawns on them, hey, you've wandered a long way from where God wants you to be. You know? And uh, what happened in the church in Corinth is an example, and we will be looking at it. But in the day-to-day -day life of a believer, for example, you know, uh, uh, a believer gets into um, a wrong relationship, you know, and just, you know, whether he, this is an, uh, an, uh, uns a single man or woman, and they slowly wander, 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 wander away into, you know, living an immoral life, or uh, a married a believer, he's a married man, he gets into a ma affair outside of marriage, then he just wanders, 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 wanders away. I'm just giving these as examples. Sometimes it could happen with money. You know, a, a believer gets trapped uh, with the pursuit of money or the misuse of money and just goes farther, further, further away from that. Or it could happen with some sort of addiction, you know, uh, with alcohol or with drugs or whatever. A believer gets trapped in it and it gets wander, wander, wander away from God. And so it's, it's it, you know... I, we're talking about believers, and, and, and if they don't keep a short account, the, you know, they don't stop right there at the very beginning that they have done something wrong that's taking me away from God. I need to pause. I need to repent. What will happen is they just make this long road, like the prodigal son, further and further away from God. And then to get them back is a journey of recovery. It starts with repentance. That means oh, I've gone far away from God's will for my life. I need to get back. Right? So what does that process look like? And how can we help either ourselves or somebody else you know, go through that process? In this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8 through 12, uh, Paul is addressing the Corinthians and he's talking about, you know, what they went through after his first letter, where he brought in a strong rebuke to the church um, and what, what happened, right? So let's just read this passage. Could somebody read verses 8 through 12 for us, please? I can read it out loud. It's right there on the screen. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, 8 through 12, please. Second Corinthians seven eight to twelve. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner, what diligence it produced in you, what clearance of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Therefore, although I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong, 
nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. Mm. Thank you, Samuel. So, Paul is uh, commending the Corinthians uh, for the way they responded to his uh, strong correction that came in the first letter. So he's saying, look, you know, uh, I, I know you were made sorry, you agree, you sorrowed, but it all worked out for good, right? Because uh, your sorrow brought about repentance and it brought about salvation. So that sorrow brought repentance, eventually leading to salvation or the restoration. But how did, what, what happened between that repentance and restoration or salvation that took place in the church among those people. And he, he writes about that in verse 11, like what actually happened? And, uh, and I just like to use that as a little framework for us to see you know, what repentance, recovery and restoration looks like. I'm just taking, from, taking it directly from, uh, primarily from verse yeah, 11, right? What does it look like? You can see. In repentance, he says, you know, there was so much of diligence. That means you were very serious about this. It's not a joke. You know, you realized, hey, we are, we messed up. And we got to correct ourselves. So they were very diligent. There was a clearing of yourselves. That means like, okay, I need to get this right. I've, I've messed up. I've done what's wrong. I need to get it right. So there was that eagerness to do what is right. Then they were indignant. That means they were really angry. Now, what was this anger about? Oh, obviously, it was an anger towards sin. So displeasure towards sin. There was fear or an alarm or a shock that I've actually let this happen in my life. I mean, I'm talking about the group believers. And there was strong desire. A holy longing, a seriousness of purpose. So, I've put these five expressions or emotions or reactions, responses under repentance. So what does repentance look like? Godly sorrow, which he says is different from the sorrow of the world. So it's, we're not talking about just being sorry about something, but this is godly sorrow. What does it look like? Well, you will look for these things, these characteristics. Is there seriousness, earnestness about this thing? Or are people just joking or just making a show? So there's got to be diligence. There's got to be a clearing of yourself. I mean, so, hey, I need, I really want to do what's right. I don't want this wrong in my life. I don't want this evil. I don't want this wickedness in me. There's got to be that indignation towards the sin. Uh, if there is only, if there is toleration, you know, whatever we tolerate will dominate. So if there is no indignation, there's no anger towards the sin, it's going to continue. There's got to be a sense of fear towards God and a sense of alarm, like how could you know I let this happen? This, that that fear is good. I'm talking about in this case, right? In in, in repentance. And there's got to be a strong desire, a holy longing towards getting this right. You see, if we don't have this, then that repentance sometimes just becomes a show. And I remember this was way back in the nineteen, uh, in the nineteen, the latter half of the nineteen eighties. There was a very, very famous preacher. 
at that time, this is back in 88, 89, at that time, he was the leading evangelist in the United States. And his program was seen worldwide. You know, that means he was, his television program was, had, was going, going into many nations. Very, you know, great evangelist, just, just amazing, you know, if you listen to him preach. Just amazing. And God, I mean, his ministry was just exploding, just growing so powerfully at that time. And then, now he was not a newcomer, right? He had been in the ministry already at least uh, by that time for you know, at least a decade or more. I, I forget the actual details, but he, he was not a newcomer. He'd been in ministry for already more than a decade. He had established ministry, growing ministry, Bible college, this, that, everything. Uh, maybe, maybe even two decades or by that time. And we don't know how long he was living in this kind of sin. But what came out in the news was he was caught with a prostitute. And that's what came out in the news. Now, we don't know how long he was living like a life like this. But it, when the news broke out, he had been caught with a prostitute and this is this is in america and it became global news because he was you know a, a very well known evangelist and all that now when the news broke out within 2 days or the sunday right after that i think i forget the exact day this this thing happened but the Sunday, he, you know, his program was telecast live from his church, whatever. But that Sunday, there was this whole, you know, uh, this whole service where he was crying in front of, you know, the tele, the TV audience, and, and before his church, before his audience, and so he was in Kansas, but he also had a church and church base and all that. And he was crying and weeping and saying, I'm sorry, and in you know, all of that. And there was no, uh, I, I, as far as I know, there was no acknowledgement of how long this was happening, whatever, whatever. And, um, uh, you know, and at that time he, he, yeah, if I remember correctly, he, would, he belonged to a particular Pentecostal denomination. Uh, and but his ministry was so big, uh, nobody could really control, have any say in it. And they, even though they withdrew, you know, that uh, denominational affiliation and recognition, he just continued in his ministry. So all he did was one service where he supposedly repented with a lot of crying and drama, all of that happened, and continued his ministry. Now, people loved him so much. He was so, one, I mean, he was so truly anointed of God, so gifted. Uh, you know, people just continued supporting his ministry. He just continued. But within two years, within two years from that incident, he was once again caught with a prostitute. Within two years. It happened again. Now, this time, what do you do? What do you say? This time, people were not as forgiving. Okay. This, and from that moment on, you know, the support of the ministry, everything. So, you know, literally such a global ministry just uh, impounded and just came crumbling down. And um, he had to, you know, this time, if he was going to repent, the repentance had to be genuine. So I'm just giving this as an example where, now, to continue the story, to already to bring the story to close, um, uh, this man, as far as I know, I think he's still alive. Um, and he, at least at, from my knowledge, the second time was a very genuine repentance. He 
he put himself in submission to, I mean, his ministry basically collapsed at that time, right? So he put himself under, you know, rigorous, uh, you know, morning and evening uh, in time and prayer and along with other leaders around him, et cetera, et cetera. And he, he continued, you know, the ministry, but, uh, you know, uh, under a lot of, uh, uh, support of people around him, so on and so forth. So he took those measures, uh, but he never recovered in terms of impact or ministry. As, he, as far as I know, the, minute, the church and the ministry is going on and, and to some extent, he's still preaching and so on. Um, uh, but uh, it's not at, you know, where it used to be. But at least the good thing was um, he put himself in, in, in a place where he would protect himself and not make the same mistake again. And um, I've not heard of any further mistakes of the same kind. But I'm just comparing the first two. Right? That in a period of two, two years, this great evangelist would repeat his mistake. Even though the first time he supposedly, you know, repented so much on top with crying and all, you know, people are feeling sorry for him, etc. But why did it happen within two years once again? Perhaps, and I'm only speaking as an outside viewer, as an observer, right? I don't want to take the place of God. I'm just sharing this as a learning for all of us, not in any way to be judgmental about the evangelist. Uh, I still respect him and he's, he's done a lot, uh, you know, and now he's probably in his 80s now. Um, anyway. I'm sharing this as a lesson for us that perhaps the first time when repentance supposedly happened, these were missing or these were just uh, uh, dramatized. You know, we know, okay, we're supposed to show all this. So, you know, we can say it in words and we can, you know, do it with tears. And, but perhaps it, re it wasn't real. And I'm not, again, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, I'm not trying to judge, but I'm just saying, you know, what could have gone wrong? Why did he, you know, fall into it within two years? And, you know, the fact that God, the people had so forgiven him and stood with him the first time, how come he would go and do it again? You know, or how many times he did it again before he was caught? We don't know. But the, the point is true repentance should have these things. There should be diligence. There should be an eagerness to do what's right. There should be an indignation towards sin. There should be holy reverence toward God and a shock. Uh, and there should be a vehement desire to do, uh, to do the right thing. Then there's a process of recovery. And I'm just taking again these, these terms from Paul's uh, 2 Corinthians 7.11. He said, there was zeal, there was vindication. So in the process of recovery, what must we do? We must fire up our passion for God, our devotion for God. So that has to be restored or recovered, right? We are going through a journey of recovery. So if you want to imagine the prodigal son, he's on his way back, making that journey back to his father's house. Now, his passion is being refined and set toward the right things as he's making the journey. Previously, his passion was on, let me have fun, let me enjoy life, let me, you know, whatever, do things, whatever. I have money to spend, I'll do it. Now his passion is, let me be a servant in my father's house. Let me serve faithfully. Let me humble myself. You know, let me be faithful to my father. Let me love my father. So that's the journey of recovery. So zeal is being restored in the right direction. Secondly, there is vindication. That means I got to punish what's wrong in my own life. And this is where Matthew 5 comes in. Whatever is wrong, pluck it out, cut it out, cast it away. There's vindication. With the help of God, 
you're punishing wrongdoing. And if it means in your own life, it's got to be done. This is where there is severity in how we deal with things. So there's this, this is involved in recovery, firing up of zeal toward God and a punishing of what's wrong. And lastly, there is that restoration that takes place. God, you know, brings back into our lives what should be there. And, uh, you know, we, we, we prove ourselves to be clear. We live life in such a way that we are without blame. We are free from blame. So look, I want to live this life uh, that's free of any of these things. So that restoration happens over time as we prove ourselves to be clear. That will take time. You know, uh, people, of course, will believe us and so on, but I've got to prove myself living a blameless life. So in our own journey, repentance, recovery, restoration, or in helping other people, you know, look at look for these things. Repentance. Is there genuine repentance? Is there recovery? And this is how recovery happens. You're restoring the passion for God. You're punishing what's wrong. You're dealing with the things that are wrong. And then you restoration. They've got to prove that they are clear of sin. Okay. So let me pause here. Um, I didn't allow time for questions, but let me see if there are any questions. Okay. Um, okay. I'm just seeing a comment here. Is the voice breaking for all? Um, okay. I've been asked. Okay. 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 All right, so let's see the questions here. Elisha's question, how many times can you repent of a particular sin? Um, the Bible doesn't tell us uh, specifically uh, what we know, Hebrews 7, verse 25. The Bible says that you know, the Lord is able to save us to the uttermost, um, those who come to him through Jesus Christ. So our answer would be, you know, God uh, will save us to the uttermost, which means we repent in as many times but uh, the, our, our, our responsibility is to you know make sure our repentance is genuine and we are looking to make that journey of recovery and restoration right um, otherwise sooner or later I think we'll be seeing in the next chapter that if we don't repent if there's no genuine repentance yeah we will see it on Wednesday it can eventually take us away, you know, slowly. It's going to move us away from that place where we will even be making a journey of recovery, right? So that's the danger if our repentance is not genuine, right? So to answer your question, you know, God saves us to the uttermost, but on the other side, repentance has to be true for our own sake, right? To make sure that we uh, are in the right place. Uh, two more questions. Um, and Brother Manohar, um, can anointing and gifts continue when there is sin in one's life? The answer is yes. You know, uh, this is because uh, one, Romans 11, verse 29, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Which God, you know, has anointed the person and put gifts and anointing uh, irrevocably. And so he continues to work through the person for the sake of the people, he will work. But there is, you know, a, a, a God-given time limit, meaning God anoints the person while the person is still struggling with sin. And, and, and God, is, you know, God is working in that person's life. But at some point, we will see a shift. Because if that person continues in rebellion, continues in sin, Initially, there'll be the stage where God is merciful and God is, you know, still anointing the person for the sake of the people and go on. But if that person doesn't get things correct or right the wrong, either 
that sin is going to be exposed. And God, you know, that's when everything will come to a halt, or at least uh, it has to be addressed with either sin will be exposed or the person is going to get into error. Right? That means that sin is going to invite the wrong kinds of spirits. And so of the Holy Spirit, they're going to start opening themselves up to the wrong kinds of spirits. And uh, it will no longer be, or it may be a mixture, or it may not be even God working through that person's life. But we, you know, we have to be discerning uh, to know when something like that has happened. But most often what happens is that sin gets exposed and, and God deals, God deals with that. Okay. Uh, Elisha, in the narration, is it the case that God may forgive him and restore him, but man may find it very difficult to? Yes, yes. Uh, so in the example that we spoke about, uh, uh, people will find it difficult, you know, to really trust that person to, after a repeat of the same incident. It's going to be hard for people to trust and, you know, understandably so. And uh, even God definitely has forgiven the person. God definitely will you know, will uh, continue to work in that person's life, but uh, people are not going to find it easy, right? Okay, um, um, there's a question from Beth. Uh, yes, uh, yes, go one, ahead. And follow up question. Mm -hmm. uh, when there is sin in one's life, can the anointing continue in the same level in its ministry? Uh, yes, for a period of time. Usually you'll find them, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, you'll find people uh, operating with the same grace, same anointing, because it's the mercy and grace of God. Uh, I mean, they, it will be going, it'll happen. And uh, so the answer is yes, you know, they could continue that way. But at some point, like we said, if the person doesn't get done, repent, their sin will be exposed and that will be, you know, pretty, pretty harsh. Or they would start journeying in the wrong direction and that's when things will get into uh, wrong things. Yeah. Okay, one last one, Matthew 6, 15. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. So uh, Matthew 6, 15. Uh, so this whole issue about forgiveness. Now, forgiveness is very important, right? We need to forgive people. We need to keep our hearts clean. Um, don't hold any bitterness or grudges. And we need to forgive people, release them. But how do we understand Matthew 6.15? Uh, we know that forgiveness for us is based entirely on what Jesus did on the cross and not on any of our works. In other words, it's not like if I have committed 10 sins and somebody has, uh, people have committed 10 sins against me, uh, after I forgive 10 sins, then my 10 sins get forgiven. It's not like that. My 10 sins are forgiven because Jesus Christ paid for all of our sins on the cross. That's the basis for forgiveness. So therefore, how should we understand Matthew 6.15? We should understand Matthew 6.15 as the experience of being forgiven in our lives happens to the extent that we extend forgiveness to others. So forgiveness, receiving forgiveness makes possible God's redeeming, saving work in my life, which is transforming. But that work in my life is limited or hindered from reaching its fullness when I fail to forgive somebody else. So it's not that my sins are not forgiven. My sins are forgiven because of the blood of Jesus Christ. But my experience of the result of being forgiven is going to be limited to the extent that I hold unforgiveness in my heart towards other people. And so, for example, my prayers could be hindered uh, because of that. Mark 11, 22, 23, 24, or 1 Peter 3, 7. Right, so this... Unforgiveness towards others, what does it do? It hurts me. It prevents me from receiving the full benefits of being forgiven in my own life because I'm not releasing it to others. Or Jesus put it like this, you know, when we have unforgiveness, we end up with the tormentors. So that means 
It doesn't mean I end up in hell, but I am tormented because I'm not forgiving somebody, although God has forgiven me. Is that okay, Beth? I hope I answered your question. Okay. All right, so I thought we would finish this this section, but uh, there's just a little bit more, which I think we can finish it in another 15 minutes um, on Wednesday, and then we will move into our third section, which is on overcoming. How do we overcome? Okay, so let's wrap up for today. I know we've taken 10 minutes extra like we always do. <laughs> Uh, could somebody pray and then we will dismiss, please. Could somebody pray with us? Shall I pray first? Please, please go ahead. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father God Almighty, for this privilege of learning your timeless, timeless truth. And Father, as we are learning it, Father, help us to be doers of the word. Help us to follow them, apply it them to our lives and be prepared for your glory for your name to be exalted in and through our lives father thank you for all the provision thank you for this platform thank you for everyone who joined in and father thank you that uh, in your wisdom and in your grace and favor we stand father thank you for every blessing and thank you for a new day once again we thank you and we give you glory honor and praise we ask this prayer in the precious and matchless name of jesus our savior amen amen Amen. Thank you, everyone. I'll see you tomorrow. God bless. Bye now. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. God bless. Thank